Welcome to Shining the Light. My name is S.E. Walebua, and my guest today is Maya Hagen Famodu. She founded Ingressive Capital, a 10 million venture fund focused on early stage African tech. She also founded Ingressive for Good, a nonprofit providing micro scholarships, technical skills, training, and talent placement. Her Ingressive adversary firm provides market entry services and tech research for corporates and investors. In 2018, Maya was recognized as a Forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur. How are you, Maya? How have you been? Thank you very much and thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So uh, how have you been dealing with this pandemic life, man? Well, it's been quite interesting, honestly. Um, there's the there's the pandemic coupled with all of the race issues that have come to light that actually have been, interestingly enough, beneficial to, I would say, African and specifically Black female entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and investors. So a lot is happening. Um, I'm excited for, for the conclusion of the year and next year. And despite the pandemic, we've seen incredible liquidity events happening in Nigeria as well, including our very own portfolio company. So lots of action. Wow. Seems like, yeah, you, you've been pretty busy. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's take a look, uh, a little bit at your background. Tell us where you were born, grew up, went to school and so forth. And also talk about how you transitioned from desiring to be a lawyer to studying a career in finance. Yeah, so to start a little bit about my background. So uh-huh. my dad, um, I'm half Nigerian, half American. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up in a little town in rural Minnesota, randomly, mm-hmm. um, and uh, studied in the U.S., Pomona College, Cornell Pre-Law Program, and uh, I worked briefly at J.P. Morgan, and I was most interested in... Um, figuring out ways in which capital can be unlocked unlocked and and resources can be unlocked to facilitate entrepreneurship in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up with half my family in the US on the Nigerian side, half my family um, back home in Nigeria and, and, and grew up with this really interesting case study of watching entrepreneurship with, with the same group of brothers, all, all things constant, same background, same, same upbringing, et cetera, et cetera. Only difference where they built their businesses. And um, they were Nigerian. Um, and I really grew acutely to understand the challenges of, associated with building uh, businesses on the continent. Mm-hmm. And that really inspired me first from a regulatory perspective. I really thought the key to unlocking capital and entrepreneurship was, uh, was located or, or based in, in the regulation and the government so- governance side of things. And I really realized after some time that in fact, business and private sector and capital really directed regulation as mm-hmm. opposed to regulation, particularly on the continent, regulation and governance, uh, directing capital or influencing capital and entrepreneurship more so. Um, and so then after some time, I, I focused on, um, the direction of finance. And then I mentioned worked at JP Morgan, worked in private equity research, and then eventually, um, started my own shop. Um, first at, at 23, tried to, um, direct, um, or, or raise my own $50 million fund, um, didn't really get very far. And so I decided to, um, instead, uh, assist global investors to um, enter the African market and and make investments on their own behalf. And then that's really where um, Ingressive Advisory came from. And then in 2017, after doing that for some years, launched the fund. Okay. I, I think you covered a little bit of uh, my, my next question because I was going to ask you why Nigeria was your best option in 2014 as a place to start business. I mean, I understand it's, it's your home, but you were born here. You knew the systems better here. You could have started here, right? Uh, were you driven? Because I, I know you, you, you know you know a lot about Africa. Were you, di- were you driven by Pan-Africanism or you just wanted to do something great for your country, Nigeria? I think it was a it was a few things. One, it was um, a relationship with my family and and really um, having that sort of passion and dedication to supporting my uh, 
my extended family, my, you know, my immediate relatives, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera. And then it was also the incredible market opportunity. So growing up on um, seeing the success of the African entrepreneur, despite dealing with 10 or even a hundred times more barriers than those in the Western world, then seeing them d- be able to succeed despite really understanding that there's something truly special about those building businesses on the continent mm-hmm. uh, as one part. And then secondly, um, seeing the transition very, very um, explicitly, you know, um, you have over a billion people on the continent and yes. um, 93% of them mm-hmm. um, have access or have mobile devices now and really understanding um, you have the fastest growing consumer classes in the world, you have the youngest population, just like the mm-hmm. macro and microeconomic um, components all contribute to um, essentially showing the time is now for tech. And so I had this, this overwhelming sense of FOMO at first, right. you know, when I, when I first went into the entrepreneurship space um, or even the business space, really, really seeing like mm-hmm. now is tech and I need to get involved because something, uh, there's a big wave that's about to crash soon. Right. But let's talk about the first two years or so when you were in Nigeria, how did you view the prospect for Nigeria and the continent at large? Was it, was it your conclusion or I mean, understanding that technology is the solution to economic empowerment in Africa. Yeah, and so so a few things. One, um, um, I understood that um, entrepreneurship is is and sort of small business small business generation are, is really a key contributor to the GDP of of um, the our target African nations. Mm-hmm. So, um, and and there's. In Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, and Egypt, there's a, a, a very strong correlation. So the places where we're actively investing and working, there's a very strong correlation there, and and in and in emerging markets or economies in general, with um, GDP growth and, and increased standards of living of the populace. So so the conclusion was, if you can make business growth and, and starting businesses easier for the people who live in the countries, mm-hmm. then um, you can in turn also be increasing the standards of living of the populace where you're, where you're, where you're building entrepreneurship. So that was, that was one component of it. And the other thing is, is tech is, is, is easy. I, 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 I'm focused on democratizing access to entrepreneurship. And that means, um, focusing on type, the type of business that allows people to anyone to start. And with technology, you need a laptop and you need some internet and you need some Mm -hmm. power as Mm -hmm. opposed to, um, oil and gas industry or agriculture industry where it's very expensive input and it's very exclusive. You have to come from money. You have to have the connections. You have to know the right people in government. And that is not a meritocratic system. That's a nepotistic system. And I'm really Mm. a strong advocate and supporter of meritocracy and ensuring brilliant people, no matter where they're located, have the tools they need to build businesses. Mm. And and from your experience, what is the uh, primary strength for the tax startup ecosystem in Africa? The, tri- the primary strength, I would say, is there, there's one, the population. Mm-hmm. Um, there's two, despite the, uh, the infrastructural challenges, I think that it, one, affords for a lot of nuanced African solutions. So you mm-hmm. can't just plug and play. Like, you can't just bring Target or, or Venmo to Nigeria because of all of the different needs of, of the consumers themselves, as well as... Um, as well as the infrastructural challenges that would like prevent the, the easy adoption and easy inter- integration of, of, of global businesses that exist. So there's a, an inherent competitive advantage and an inherent barriers to entry that allow for the growth and, and thriving of, of African made entrepreneurship. Um, um, yeah, so those are, those are some of the things and, and, and really I, people don't realize like, you have a, a whole continent of a, over a billion people and over, over half of them, That's like 75% crazy. are under the age of 35, 40, per, 40 plus percent are under the age of 15. It's an incredibly young population. That's young and that, population. Yes. That in and of itself creates an incredible opportunity as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you, you said you started the investment fund with that VC training. So talk about the challenges you face. Secondly, uh, share with us the innovative approaches you took to establish a track record. Yeah. So um, I started, as I mentioned, I, I, I tried to start the fund when I was 23. And yes, yes, you did. You, did, you mentioned before. It, yeah, it really, it didn't work. <laughs> um, I didn't have the experience and um, I was about 
out of, out of university. Um, and so when I was, uh, and so I initially uh, started out, um, saying, okay, if, if I can't, if you won't give me money directly, mm-hmm. then how about I sh- viable investment opportunities and you can independently make the decisions and I will just assist you essentially as a consultant or an advisor of how to do the deals and how, how to close the investments. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. Um, and so, um, we, we built up or I built up a track record of being able to source viable investment opportunities, negotiate deals, and then support, uh, investors, portfolio companies over time. And, um, I guess the way to start the fund or the way to actually make investments is either like you have to prove three things. You have to prove one, I can find good deals. Um, one, I can get into good deals because, uh, you know, you, there are some people who have the talent of, yeah, I can identify quality investment opportunities, but they don't have the competitive advantage to be able to close those, those investments. So it's fine, source good deals, close good deals. And then also once I'm in the deals, I can actually add value to the company such that I am a distinct source of capital for this company. I can contribute to their success. And so it's over time. However, you can, you can do it in any number of ways, but um, you have, you really have to focus on proving those three things in order to get the capital um, to start independently making investments. Mm. Um, I, I was listening to you in one of the videos you did and you talked about how the lack of mental, spiritual and emotional development can hinder an individual success, success right? Uh, mm-hmm. Can you please expand on that? Because from what I gathered, this was your Achilles here right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I would say that, um, when I started out, um, mm-hmm. I had done a lot of, uh, personal development. And so for the first, I'd say year of business building, mm-hmm. we didn't get very, it was kind of spinning wheels and, and staying in, in the same place. And it's mainly because, um, as you mentioned, I didn't do the work on myself first because Mm -hmm. one, it, it, we had high attrition, which was people didn't stay with the organization for long because of my inability to communicate effectively, just, you know, establish clear objectives and KPIs on the front end such that we were aligned, you know, employee employer relationship. And we had aligned vision for what the organization was supposed to be doing as well as like quantitative, like very objective, um, tangible goals for, for staff, which is really, really fundamental in, in, in driving success and how, and maintaining healthy relationships and that stuff, just as far as the structural stuff on the organization, as well as, uh, and then a separate, a separate note, um, um, including, um, how do I explain this without sounding too like airy fairy, but, no, um, <laughs> You know, I, I work with a transformational coach and, and he gave me some incredible advice, which was, you know, your subconscious functions like a thermostat, whatever temperature it's at, no matter how many heaters or air ACs you bring into the room or fans, eventually the room always reverts to the temperature at which the uh, thermostat is set. As in, if you believe, you know, I have the ability to do this, I deserve this, et cetera, et cetera, you will achieve that. If there's something in your subconscious that believes I'm not good enough, um, I don't deserve these opportunities, blah, blah, blah. No matter how much um, you you invest, no matter how many investors or really, or, or, you know, uh, influential people you put yourself in front of, eventually you will always come back to the place where you truly believe mm-hmm. you deserve to be. And, you know, you can read, do there's certain things like reprogramming, reprogramming the subconscious with just like leaving notes and doing, you know, mirror work and that type of stuff, mm-hmm. um, as well, as, uh, you know, working with professionals and also doing, doing different sorts of trainings and, and, uh, and different research in, in, in that area. And I did a combination of all the things I read books on, you know, compassion and empathy, mm-hmm. et cetera you know, the practical business side of things as well. So I could be an effective um, manager and guide people in a way that was like motivational. Um, And on the same time and the same side or on a separate side worked on myself and reprogramming my subconscious. Um, Definitely, you know, doing the work um, um, because, and then like, you know, spiritually and, and health wise as well, because like I always say, your, your body is essentially the generator powering the house. And if you don't service the generator, mm-hmm. then the house, you know, have light. 
Mm, that's 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 pretty powerful. I want to go back to uh, to the uh, to the to the advisory because I want our or attendees to get the story right. So when you started Ingressive Advisory, I believe between 2014 and 2017, was it a way to establish trust with investors so in the long run, short run, you could actually launch Ingressive Capital? Was that the strategy or? Uh, I would say, so I always knew that I wanted to launch the VC fund. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, the advisory firm and, and building relationships in that way was was really a, a, a means to an end to be able to launch the, v, the VC fund. Yes, but the end goal, as I mentioned, is our our whole all of our companies and all of our initiatives and everything we do. The the whole purpose is to um, ensure that. Um, brilliant people on the continent, wherever they're located, have the tools and resources to build wildly scalable businesses. And capital is one mechanism to do that, but our, our advisory firm was another mechanism, as well as uh, the nonprofit providing micro scholarships, technical skills development, and talent placement is another mechanism through which we can ensure that's possible for everyone. Mm. So in 2017, you launched Ingressive Capital with the aim of investing directly in tech startup across motherland. Can you talk about your traction and the impact thus far? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so to date, we've invested in 30 uh, or we've made 30 investments. We're about to make our 31st investment. Wow. That's um, great. 1% of our companies are Y Combinator alumni now. Um, another uh, portion in our Techstars tech 500, et cetera. Um, all except two of our companies have uh, received or have, have, have uh, closed mm -hmm. follow on um, next stage rounds. So, like, say we invested in pre seed, they've done Series A, et cetera. Um, um, 33% of our portfolio companies are female founded. Mm. Um, we've had one bar. So our very first portfolio company sold to Stripe for 200 million plus about a month ago. Um, and yeah, um, the 50% of our team is female and, and we just hired another woman to head our growth. Um, we'll, we'll keep that, um, through, uh, fun too, as well. Um, and uh, as far as our nonprofit, uh, it's given out 5,000 unlimited Coursera courses. We've sponsored a number of students' computer science degrees at, at African universities. Um, I think they, they, we've built out now a 10,000-member developer network uh, at every major university in Nigeria and in seven other countries. Um, and we just closed um, another, so about $200,000 in uh, donations that are, is going directly to um, recipients. So for Ingressive, Ingressive for Good, uh, you guys covered the, the whole of Africa or right now you guys are just in Nigeria? In yeah, mm -hmm. Ingressive good is actually taken there are a number of initiatives in the advisory firm because so we serviced um uh venture capital firms as well as technology businesses um in um that wanted to enter the african market and in addition to sourcing and and helping them close mm -hmm. deals on the continent we also had to grow the total addressable market um in order for them to really expand across the continent and so in doing that we built a number of initiatives that were really focused on capacity building and tech integration for, for the youth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and those programs we actually removed from the advisory firm and put into the nonprofit. And so, um, the, the nonprofit new initiatives are exclusively in Nigeria, but those other ones like, um, ingressive campus ambassadors that have been going on for the last three, four years. Um, those ones are pan-African. Mm, that's great. So in 2019 alone, my African tech ecosystem received about 490 million, where 311 companies were found were funded. Things were also going well in the first quarter of 2020. So Maya, what is the impact of the pandemic right now on African economies as far as funding is concerned? Do you see the decline in funding as we as we as we move on? Um, and, and so to, to give, so there are a number of different research reports that, that include a, diff, a number of different, um, that have reached a number of, of different, um, funding amounts. Mm -hmm. Um, but we were at $2.2 billion if you're including, um, the, 
the growth rounds of African tech as well. Okay. And this year, I, I'm not going to be surprised. You know, we've we've been doubling the amount of VC dollars um, for mm -hmm. the last since 2000. In 2016, 129 million, 2017, 560, 2000, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, um, I would think this year we would be over 3 billion. If you're counting the IPOs like Helios Towers, um, InterSwitch, if they do IPO on the London Stock Exchange, the $500 million acquisition of, of uh, SendWave by World Remit, the $200 million acquisition of, of Paystack by Stripe, um, right. there's, you know, auto tech company in South Africa that was acquired as well. There's been a number of financial services um, acquisitions, you know, um, Luno in, in, in Nigeria as well, and, and the cryptocurrency trading platform. Um, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if we beat last year's um, amount of venture capital dollars. Um, as far as... Uh, uh, there are a number of different reports and, and again, on, on the continent, not everything is incredibly transparent, especially the angel and early stage deals. They're not publicized like they are in the U S necessarily. Uh, and especially in pandemic times, it can, there can actually be an adverse reaction of vendors and um, the ecosystem. If founders announce the raises so that uh, even our own companies as a strategy have not been formally announcing their, their additional follow on um, funding rounds. Mm. And so from heuristics and not data, so what I'm actually seeing is, as somebody who's on the ground, um, I am seeing an increase in angel. I am seeing global investors continue to increase the number of African deals that they do, particularly this year uh, when, you know, the uh, dollar's sort of weakening, treasury bills aren't as, as attractive in the Western world as they've been before before um you know people are moving their their capital to um silver and gold etc cetera, etc cetera, and also looking to emerging markets that still have those i wouldn't be surprised if this year there was another increase in the amount of vc dollars um as it's been a year on year on year 2x since 2016 about a 2x um I wouldn't be surprised if this year we had another increase because what I'm seeing um, and what I mentioned about, uh, I'm not sure if you heard, but um, the this year there, I've noticed as, as somebody on the ground, I'm speaking from heuristics and not data, um, being on the ground, our companies have strategically not been announcing their raises because in COVID times, it can have an adverse effect on <coughs> either driving um, competition um, or as like a market validator or vendors, et cetera, increasing pricing when they see that a company has raised money. And so um, I would say this year we're not seeing, um, and I, I, can, I can say for my own company and companies I know in the ecosystem, they're not being publicized. So despite the fact that we aren't seeing necessarily the same amount of announcements, I'm seeing the same amount of deals happening on ground and also rounds filling up much faster and including foreign investors more. And that as far as capital, not only is capital being unlocked for Black and African entrepreneurs due to, you know, the global um, uh, racial inequities and everything that's happening, as well as um, different European governments dedicating capital specifically to African tech and uh, mm -hmm. sovereign entities uh, in Africa, um, finally participating in the venture capital space as, you know, the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority investing in us. And they're also doing direct deals um, into African tech. Um, but aside from this, uh, we are also seeing, um, how do I, how do I phrase this? Um, I would say due to the fact that there is a decreased yield on treasury bills and sort of more inflation in, in some, uh, uh, fiat currencies, people are looking to put their capital in equity and, um, and particularly in equity in economies that previously had double digit growth and in COVID times they're anticipating will still have some element of positive uh, GDP growth relative to the slower, you know, one to two growth rates of Western economies. And um, I've, I've seen an increased appetite for venture capital, surprisingly, despite everything happening in the world from a lot of Western institutions. Mm. So 
this year, you know, and, and there have been a number of sizable deals that have even been announced, including Sendwave, the $500 million acquisition of Send, Sendwave by World Remit, um, you know, you know the, the Nigerian crypto trading platform acquisition. There's an auto tech company in, um, in South Africa. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised. And if we're count, counting the Helios Towers as well as the potential InterSwitch IPO, I wouldn't be surprised if we were over $3 billion this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that crisis accelerate change. Uh, talk about tech innovations being adapted right now, particularly in terms of scaling. I know edutech and e-health are among spaces on the rise or expanding, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would say on ground, you know, there are a number and at the beginning of the of the pandemic, people were so worried mm -hmm. about this actually stifling innovation and stifling technology. But it's really interesting. A lot of the, the biggest businesses that we know either came out of, you know, Great Depression times or the 2008 to the art 2007 2008 crisis you know airbnb um those types of businesses um that are now global billion dollar you know some of the top technology companies in the world really came out of the the financial crisis of 2007 2008 and <coughs> what we're seeing on the continent as well as those business models that that sort of were bleeding cash not necessarily the most sustainable they are they are quite suffering and the guys that were still trying to figure out product market fit but what we're all also seeing is incredible opportunities presenting themselves as people stay at home, are engaging more with technology and spending more, spending less on um, like retail consumer goods, like as in um, clothing and and um, and sort of physical assets. Engaging more and spending more on um, technology, internet costs, power, um, and then healthcare and health tech services and and sort of digital entertainment. Um, as well as digital education, we're definitely seeing the same trends on the continent and not only investments in those space and increased capital for those spaces, but um, new and interesting innovations happening as new market opportunities open up. And I would say this certainly did expedite the use of technology. Mm -hmm. So not just mobile phones, which everyone has a dumb phone, but mm -hmm. also people transitioning to um, using internet um, more and not just for you know the Instagram and the and the random bank app, but really sort of integrating their life in, in various services, whether it be the logistics component for e-commerce um, or like actual engaging with doctors on on you know mm -hmm. telemedicine um, or engaging with education content online, the usage of Coursera and different ed, ed tech companies across across the continent as well, we're definitely seeing a transition and an increase. My, I, 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 th I think you thought I was talking about the, the police brutality, the answers, you know, how did that affect you guys? Yeah. Um, oh, this conversation. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm all over. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, not this cover. Just, just the yeah. NSARS thing. It's, it's, a, it's still a sore spot. Um, yes. mm -hmm. I actually live maybe three straight streets away from the lucky toll gate. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and we were delivering su medical supplies and, um, moving pharmaceuticals, um, immediately after the massacre happened and the, and the hospitals were filled up and, and, um, actual logistics providers were refusing to go on the street. We had to get an ambulance ourselves and move the, the medical supplies ourselves. And so, um, it's a, it's something I, I know very intimately cause I'm right there in it. Um, and I would say, um, two things really, really stuck out from the movement as to what's really, truly different of, of this generation and what's happening now and, and, and can't happen again. Um, or can't or like old, old, pa old patterns of political leadership in, in Nigeria cannot and will not happen again. I can tell because, um, <clears throat> one, the role of women as, as leaders of this movement and the, the collective support of, there's no more. Like the, the, with the NSARS, it was really exciting to see there, there wasn't any tribalism or sexism or ageism. It was, it was very much a movement led by youth and women at the forefront as far as raising capital, um, deploying capital, um, sort of supporting all those who were actively engaging in the movement and the focus on peace and respect of everyone who was in it um, or who is in it. That was on one side. And the other one was the use of technology and social media um, to convene, to organize, to um, sort of collate this sort of decentralized 
um, asks of our political leadership and to spotlight those who weren't doing things fairly. Um, and, and then also, um, even during the looting and when things got out of hand, as in like identifying the warehouses of palliatives that the government had been stealing, um, the use of social media and then the, the radical flow of bodies to those spaces momentarily. And then last thing, um, yeah, again, I, I mentioned this already, but I just want to highlight it again of mm -hmm. the, 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 um, the expedited movement of capital. Um, this really shows the engagement of the diaspora and, and how fed up sort of collectively we are at every level of society. Um, the, 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 the issues that my team is dealing with are the same issues that, you know, the Dangote's team is dealing with are the same issues that, you know, you know kind of across like the, the Malams are dealing with, but you know, we're kind of all experiencing the same traumas and the same issues. And, um, and I don't think Nigeria will ever be the same. I don't think we're going to revert and go back. I think that there's only progress ahead. And I think that there, um, we're, we will all be positively surprised in 2023. At, um, and what I'm seeing on ground is, is people are not going to sit back. Everyone's act actually getting involved and, and actually, though quietly, um, making real moves for real change. Mm, wow. Thank you for that insight, Amaya. Um, I'm totally uh, pro-Africa, you know. <laughs> um, many African tech innovations like M-Pesa or Shashidi have had global success. What more can African economies do to attract venture capital that invests in African innovation for the global market? Continue telling the story of success. I think money moves. Like mm -hmm. investors just need the data points of proving that liquidity exists because I, I will continue to get money to invest in companies if I can give my investors positive returns, like, you know, meaningful returns. And, and I think there are so many, there are so many people trying to, to take and capture the, the narrative uh, or the African story and the African narrative. And mm -hmm. I think it's really, really important that we continue publicizing, like telling our own story and publicizing and highlighting the successes because like even just this pay stack exit, I'm seeing not only is it unlocking, cap unlocking capital for me as my own portfolio company, but also, the ecosystem generally, investors who've never never before written checks for African tech are contacting me where they can where they should put their money, you know, how they can invest in our fund, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so telling tell the stories, publicize, highlight, like speak about it. That's that's that is really the way as increasing investorship for um, the 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 next generation of African innovators. Mm. So in in the um, in the Silicon Savannah, as as the East Africa tech scene is called, about only ten percent of all funding for startups goes to uh, local founders. In a twenty seventeen study by a Village Capital, expatriates founders receive more funding. So, what policy environment can be put in place to ensure local founders access and receive similar levels of funding? Yeah. Um, and I want to correct that. That's not African founders at large. That's specifically okay. East African founders. Okay. In Nigeria, that's absolutely not the case. The okay. vast majority of um, <coughs> venture capital entrepreneurs do and have, um, or th 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 those who are receiving um, capital, venture capital, and are in the technology entrepreneurship space in Nigeria specifically are Nigerian. That's what, like a, a, across the board, it's very anomalous to see non-indigenous founders receiving capital um like independently without co-founders who are who are african um and i think that um i can talk about the why i think that exists and then and then what policies and regulations can can support ensuring that there's capital dedicated to, to local founders mm -hmm. i think again um uh local african institutions like there aren't that many african funds and that's because there's not that much African capital, institutional capital dedicated to the technology space. So I think one way that would be really easy is um, influencing our sovereign entities in our endowments, our pension funds uh, to start investing in local venture capital firms or, or start or to inc increase their appetite um, or open their appetite to, um, to the venture capital space, as well as, you know, banks and different sort of financial institutions, uh, ensuring that they have an allocation for, for, um, for technology and venture capital. And that I think would, would really 
solve some element of it because um, a lot of these guys that are raising cat or raising funding, I know it particularly in East Africa and are not indigenous, have broad venture capital networks back in their home countries. And that's something that, that the local entrepreneurs don't necessarily have as much of, um, or the, the VCs that they know can write them, you know, like a $50,000 check or something like that. It's a bunch of micro VCs locally, but if we can increase the capital there, then we can increase, um, that, which, which is looking at indigenous entrepreneurs. That's one element. Um, the other one I think is, is, you know, there, there's, I, I see a lot of pushback from this and, and I, it's gone one, one way or the other. Um, you know, Ghana has, has had this policy, but is, is in recent years reflecting and, and deciding Nigeria has had this in the oil and gas space, but ensuring that there's one um, national who has, who own, who's an equity owner and a director in the business. Um, like if you, if you want to incorporate a business, you have to have one national, um, domestic owner and and some do you know they have to be 50 or there has to be at least 51 percent um um indigenous ownership of of all businesses that are incorporated um some don't have that requirement there 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 are pros and cons to to both sides and i'm not sure that that having such specific equity stipulations is helpful but i think in definitely ensuring that there's one national um uh, included as a director or, or a, uh, an equity holder in entities when they're incorporated. I think that could be an effective strategy. Um, also, um, teaching more about like ESOPs and, um, just, just the influence of, uh, using equity to properly align incentives of employees as opposed to just like the salary base, uh, which, which will come through increased liquidity when, as, re as people respect sort of the, the, the value of liquidity more, because I think historically people have, you know, businesses are there one day, gone the next day as these, you know, African economies can be quite volatile. But as, you know, and in instances like Paystack, there will be a Paystack mafia that comes out now. And not only people who are, have the technical skills, but also people who are, are, are building wealth now from being equity holders in this business. And so I think that element of it as well will, will help. Mm -hmm. Um, and so innovations in, uh, innovations in the African tech scene seem to be dominated by digital banking and fintech. Correct me if I'm wrong. So what other tech sectors would you like investors to focus on in the next five years? Or what is your prediction in the African tech scene in the, next, in the near future, Maya? Yeah, I think that, I mean, the vast majority of capital and what's publicized, again, um, I want to I wanna distinguish the... Yes, the majority of capital, even for us, you know, like 60% of our investments almost are in the financial services sector. Mm -hmm. But there are there is sexy tech that receives a lot of coverage from the Western world and from, you know, just the uh, platforms in general. And there's unsexy tech that is still receiving, you know, venture capital and still receiving investment, but, but maybe either the team themselves is the teams are not publicizing it or those are not the stories that are being picked up. So um, I'm seeing investment and a lot of opportunities in the health tech space. And I think that's only going to con continue in the, ed tech, in the ed tech space as well. And then general unsexy tech, like, you know, energy, um, energy logistics software, or um, definitely like accounting payroll as, as economies um, contract I think I, I see the use of, of technology tools that either promote um, employee efficiency, operational efficiency or oversight, um, um, or assist with margins and, and tracking of financials. Um, and then the very, very basic stuff that we haven't really figured out yet, including power, internet, um, infrastructure, roadways, logistics, the movement of, of also like within the agriculture, specifically in West Africa, um, within the agriculture, um, sort of logistics, whether that be cold storage, um, sort of transport, um, movement of, uh, of highly perishable goods, leveraging drones or some sort of, sort of non road solutions. Uh, I think there will be interesting plays there as well, uh, and also something that we do and is and and is easy to 
check out is if you're looking to invest in an African economy, just look at the GDP and what are the largest growth sectors in the last like five years of that African economy and, and within the GDP breakdown. And like, that's really where, um, though unsexy, um, that's really where the technology innovations have opportunity to really reach those meaningful scales to get that venture capital return. And that's really where those solutions are needed as well. Mm. Let's talk the diaspora. Um, global remittances to Sub-Saharan grew by 10% to uh, 40, 46 billion in 2018. What are some ways the diaspora can accelerate the tech scene in Africa, Maya? Um, yeah, by putting their, by investing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, certainly by making their money work. Uh, whether it's small checks, um, or, or incentivizing again, that same ambassadorship that I was talking about, telling the narrative, like mm -hmm. sharing the story with others or being within their, their, their organizations in the Western world, being the one to pioneer. Sometimes the, um, the African team member doesn't want to necessarily be the one to be like hyping, like, of course, you know, they expect me to be the one trying to push Africa all the time. You do it, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think that sometimes we don't understand the incredible competitive advantage we have in understanding a very nuanced but massive uh, consumer demographic. Like we are all assets within our organizations wherever we're located. And I think that more that the diaspora realizes that this is like very much an arrow in, in you know, um, an additional arrow in, in, in their kit. Um, the, the faster that we can create those strengthening relationships with, with, between the diaspora and the continent. And also um, investing in, in policy and, and political movements. I think, you know, whether it's donating to the, you know, previously when the NSARS was activated, just making a small donation for food or, or logistics or what have you. Um, you know, entrepreneurship can only move so far without having the buy-in of government. And you can't, like, we, we can't have a thriving entrepreneurship ecosystem if, if we're still dealing with, like, blinding corruption and, and stupid leaders. And so um, whether it's investing in PACs or, you know, just donating to, 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 to new political leadership that you truly have researched and believe are, are aligned with the, the future that you want to see on the continent. Um, I think that's very important too. And there are a bunch of rolling funds that have very low minimums, like a thousand dollars or, you know, a few thousand dollars a year or a month or a quarter, um, dedicating some component of one's earnings to be able to have exposure to the venture capital space, I think is very important and doable now with all of the different sort of crowdfunding and rolling fund platforms. Mm. And then what is um, Ingressive's criteria, criteria for investing in local entrepreneurs? Yeah. Um, and one last thing I want to add on the last is, is we, ha we all have technical expertise and we all have different sort of skills that we've learned from our various organizations. I think even the mentorship and advisory and just giving connections is incredibly helpful as well. So if people can't actually add, you know, can, can actually donate or, or invest, mm -hmm. definitely being able to invest with one's expertise and resources. And as far as what we look for as, as ingressive in companies that we want to invest in, um, we have like a, a very, very long diligence checklist. Um, but in that, the main parts are we look at the team. So not only do we want people who know each other and have, um, have built things together or have had some relationship historically, but two, they, they have a, an acute understanding of their target demographic, either because they've lived there or they've worked in this space or they've serviced those company or those companies or people or what have you at, at their previous, um, work. But we also want to see a technical person in house, like somebody who's built something similar to the thing that they're building now or has like a very advanced ability um, in the technology space such that we're confident they have the ability to comprehensively think through and build the technology infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. So like the team competence, technical, and them knowing each other. Mm -hmm. The next thing is total addressable market. Like, like we are not looking for solutions where there's maybe a thousand people who want it or a hundred thousand people who want it. This is, we're looking for things that, you know, can this be a continent wide solution? Are there people across every demographic um, or, you know, every major city or what have you on, on the continent where this solution can be relevant? 
Um, and then, so typically it's, it's because of that, because of what the per capita GDP is and, and what the profile of an African entrepreneur looks like, that typically means it's low margin and high volume, um, type of solutions that we're looking for, as opposed to like catering goods to like luxury, you know, luxury goods or, or, um, or nice to haves for, for the African consumer. Um, and the other thing that we look for is, is this, uh, in the practical is we look at post-traction businesses. So you've launched, you're in market, um, you've established product market fit. And we can tell that because you have repeat buyers, people are actually willing to pay for your solution. The economics make sense. Um, we are looking for things that are either low cash burn or near term to profitability. So we're not looking for like you to figure out how to monetize in 10, 20 years and raise billions of dollars before then. No, I want business models. That make sense. You should be making money. Um, and then also, uh, we want to work with like humble people who are hungry and curious and just respectful and have integrity and, uh, and building interesting stuff in, in sectors or, or industry or industries that we think are high growth over time. Mm. Uh, from your own perspective and experience, what would you say is the secret for success? Uh, in an in an African entrepreneur, yes, I think the secret for success. <laughs> I don't think there's any one secret for success. I think that okay. it, that we're we're continuously discovering. What about in general? Um, <laughs> okay, well, I think the things that I was mentioning. So, um, cultivating a core, a, a key skill set. One also under just as much as you build your own strengths, really understanding what your weaknesses are, and then um, hiring and recruiting people who have aligned vision and can make up for um, or have strengths where your weaknesses lie. So, really, it's it's a big. You know, I think the African entrepreneur can have an aversion to teamwork sometimes <laughs> at scale. Um, or, you know, because of the lack of, of enforcement of IP, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, I think people can be a little weary of, of sharing their ideas and, and, and working together and, and sort of, um, focusing on, um, collaboration, you know, the, the bigger pie, smaller piece type thing. Um, and so I think it's essential to work together and to realize that you go farther with people. Um, collaboration is essential always. Um, and I think having integrity, again, being humble. Um, if you're building a technology tool, you're literally building something for the needs of other people. And thus you need to be highly and acutely aware of what the needs of other people are and exactly specifically how to best cater to them. And uh, an, an, an acute attention to both the financials and the, and the metrics. Um, so sometimes people are building things and not, you know, not realizing that they have incredible attrition or um, that, you know, their churn in, you know, after, 10 days, you know, they, they're so excited. They have initial users, but their churn or their retention numbers or, or their MAU, DAU, WAU, their, their monthly active users, et cetera, is not um, as engaging as, as they should be. And they don't focus on, on those small nuances, which uh, at the end of the day, build a, a great technology company. So being, a, being paying close attention to the numbers, listening. Hmm. Your last word, Maya, message of hope. <laughs> um, I, 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 I have never been like every day that I'm in the ecosystem, I become increasingly inspired, increasingly dedicated to the success and the growth of, uh, the African tech ecosystem. And we will, I, I strongly believe we will, we will in soon time reach a point where brilliant people, no matter where they're located, have the tools they need to build wildly scalable businesses across Africa. So as we continue to invest together, as we continue to support each other in this journey, and that's the fundamental piece of supporting each other in this journey, we will realize that goal. Thank you, Maya, for joining us today. Uh, we thank you for your brilliance, for your knowledge, for your education. We don't take this for granted. Thank you so much for uh, being part of us today. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm I'm available on Instagram or by email. My my username is Mayanator, M-A-Y-A-N-A-T-O-R, and I answer 100% of DMs. So if anyone has any follow-up questions or wants to know anything further or be connected to techies in the ecosystem, I am happy to be a resource and a connection point. Wow. That's great. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, everybody. 
Thank you. Have a great day. Have a blessed day. Blessed day.